We are now recording. Hey, Dirk's here as well. So we've got another, hey Dirk. Dirk's another great, wonderful, engaged, leading uh, Rotarian. So we're very um, happy to have you with us here today. So I'm gonna share the screen again, everybody. If you could do me a favor and put, put, put your thumbs up if you could. Yes, okay. Yeah. Okay, so we put this here um, to say really welcome to the movement because the idea here is that we're, we're growing a movement. We're growing a movement of young and not so young new generations of war abolishers and peace builders. And the war part is very, very important as well. Peace building is very important, but also war abolition as well because war, as, as many that will be with us today um, that work with us at World Beyond War, war is the biggest threat to peace building um, in the world. So it's important that we also address what we don't want war and what we do want peace building. So welcome to the movement. This is where, let's start with the end in mind. This is the plan that we have to get through today in the next hour and a half. The idea is really to, it's an information session. So the idea is to introduce the new initiative. First of its kind initiative as, as discussed uh, between two global organizations, Rotary, as we know, global organization, uh, 1,200,000 members worldwide, 36,000 clubs. Uh, the core focus of Rotary is um, to increase goodwill, peace and understanding. World Beyond War, we're also a global grassroots people-based movement with membership in 190 countries. Um, our executive director has been nominated in several times for the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, and just to let you know, I should have introduced, so I'm Phil, I'm the education director for, for World Beyond War. We're very fortunate at World Beyond War to have got global recognition and won several awards for our educational work in particular. Uh, one was that we got the award for um, from the Global Challenges Foundation, only 10 organizations in the world, based on our educational approach to um, global challenges such as nuclear weapons, war and climate change. I mean, I, I'm also a Rotary Peace Fellow as well, so I've been very fortunate over the last 10 years or more to work on projects, including global grants with Rotarians in different countries um, in different contexts. Here's where we're going to today. So to introduce the new project, talk about its rationale. Why did World Beyond War decide to work with Rotary Action Group for Peace on this project? Some of the benefits um, for both young people, adults, Rotarians, communities for engaging in this work, how it works, what's the model that we use and ways to get involved. Uh, we're gonna hopefully hear as well from some youth leaders that we work with both within Rotary and um, World Beyond War. And we wanna use this as an opportunity to really get your feedback as well. We've been working on this for, for some time now um, with, with Alison. I'd like to introduce so Alison's the chair of the Rotary Action Group for Peace. And we've been working very, very closely on this and, and met some people on the call as well, actually for months now have been working together um connecting each month around this but we really want to use it as an opportunity to hear from you as well to inform <laughs> what it would look like before we do that let's i always like to do this let's do a bit of a check-in to see who's here so we know who's here and you've wrote but let's make this a little bit interesting okay so why let's uh let's so i'm going to ask a question and, and i've put i've come off the the video here i'm going to ask a question and if the answer is yes you could either Put your hands up like this, or you can stand up, or you can take yourself off mute and shout, yes. Make sense? Yes, put your thumbs up if it makes sense. Yes. It does make sense. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. So stand up, shout, or put your hands up if you're a Rotarian. Yes. yes. Okay, great, 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 great. Stand up, uh, shout, or put your hands up if you're a Rotary Peace Fellow. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, okay, we got Rotary Peace Fellows, great. Uh, stand up, put your hands up, um, or shout if you are a um, Interact or Rotaract. Who's that? Who's that, did somebody say? I'm asking, what's, what is that? Good question. Explain the ages, Phil. Yes, please go ahead, Alison. All right. An interactor in this part of the world 
would be someone who is probably at high school, we call it secondary, up to the age of late 17s. All right, so from about 12 to 17. A rotaractor is 18 to 30, roughly, because they've exceeded the above age. So for the purpose of this project, we've exceeded the age to 35. All right, Thor? Super, thank you very much. Perfect. Put, put your hands up, shout or stand uh, if you are from World Beyond War. Yay! Okay. We Yay. <laughs> Great. Okay, here we go. Here's the tricky one. Put your hand up, shout or stand up if you want to see more peace in the world. Yay! 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 Okay. Okay, so what we've done there is that we've seen that there's diversity. So we've got Rotarians, Interact, Rotaract, Rotary Peace Fellows, people from World Beyond War, diversity in terms of um, different age groups, different contexts as well. We came to 10 or more different contexts. But what really binds us and keeps us together is this common belief, this common um, ambition to bring about more peace in the world. That's what brings us all together. So thank you so much for that. And we also do that as well to kind of make things a little bit interactive. So it's lovely to kind of get to know each other. So thank you for, um, for doing that with us. I'm gonna share the screen again now. Next, um, before moving further, it would be remiss of me not to do a big shout out and do a big thank you. Uh, like all good movements, as people know, World Beyond War, we're, we're based on a people movement. We cannot do any of our work without the wonderful people on the ground that we work with. Some of the wonderful people are on the call right now. So we want to do a bit of a shout out. A shout out to start with to the young people. And when I say young people, these includes uh, Interact, Rotaract, also as Alison is one of the co-founders, Rotaract for Peace. This project really came about through and arose uh, through recommendations from those young people, including as well, not just young people, but some of our alumni at World Beyond War, who basically said, we love the educational programs, we love the conferences, you know, we love the activities, but in order to make progress in the world, and as we know, social change is not just brought about through education or not just through action. Social change is brought about through the combination of both education and action. So they were really calling for us to, can we put together a project which combines education and action, which brings together young people and adults together in a common purpose of working towards a world beyond war and the promotion and advancement of peace and security. So we really, there's a big shout out. So thank you, thank you, thank you. The next thank you goes, and I know Alison won't like this, but she deserves it. It goes to Alison Sutherland, who's the, the chair of the Road Traction Group for Peace. I want to say this, not just being a wonderful professional colleague, Alison, I want to say that I really appreciate your support, and you know what I mean, uh, in different ways. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, this project has only come about because of Alison's leadership and getting through an, a memorandum of understanding so that we'll be on what now have with the Road to Action Group for Peace. So thank you to you, Alison. And also thank you to some of the other Rotarians that are on the call. So Sue, Jackie, Sarah, uh, Jim, some of the others that have been on these calls supporting us. Thank you so much for that support. And finally, thank you to you all that are all on the call. Um, we really hope that this, our time together today on this call, and it might be the first time that we spoke together, will lead to more time together in the future, hopefully through this project. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Truthfully, thank you so much. Let us say a little bit about whenever looking at projects before talking about more details about the project. So as we know, it's a peace education and action project. The peace education part will be six weeks online and the peace action part will be an eight week uh, project mentoring process, bringing young people and adults together. I'm going to say more about that shortly so that you have an idea of what the project's about. But the starting point for any project should not be what we're going to do or how we're going to do it. The starting point is always the question of why. Why is this, port, this project needed? So that brings us to this question. Why is World Beyond War and the Rotary Action Group for Peace doing this project? Well, here's our argument. 
We think that equipping young people with the skills, tools and support to prevent war and promote peace is one of the largest, most global and important challenges facing humanity, bar none. That is the, ch the challenge that we have set. Let's break that down. When we look at things, okay, we know that conflict is part of everyday life. Can't get away from it. Um, it's necessary in some parts. I'm, I'm here in Bolivia. It's, it's often seen as necessary. What is not necessary is violent conflict. Violent conflict is the issue. And violent conflict is an issue in every single city, in every single country around the planet. Now, research shows we're now at a 30-year high in terms of violent conflict around the world. The quintessential version of violence is war. As, as people from World Beyond War will know, war is development in reverse. And what we mean by that is, is that it diverts attention away from productive activities. Violence costs, according to the Institute for Economics and Peace, 14 trillion it costs us, you know, to contain violence. Two trillion a year is spent on preparing for war. Half of that comes from the US. All of us are implicated in the war systems. If one thing comes away today, we're not just talking about war out there, we're talking about how war is prepared and invested in the global North countries. So that really justifies the importance of peace. Peace is a task for everyone. So it's not just about governments. It's not just about elite levels. Peace is a task for everyone. If you follow the, the United Nations culture of peace, they, they, they state that very, very clearly that everybody has a role to play in, in peace building. That's a Galton quote, by the way, Johan Galton, who's the founder of uh, peace studies. Um, peace is essential to sustainable development. The United Nations say there can be no sustainable development without peace. There can be no peace without sustainable development. So they're both interlinked. In order to make progress on education, on health, on all the other 17 goals, we need to be addressing peace because violence interrupts our progress on any of the other sustainable development goals. Well, the good thing is, is that one way of working towards peace, it's one way, it's not the overall solution, it's part of a, a multi, a complex process, peace education. Peace education could be un understood in different ways, but one way of thinking about it is, is providing the knowledge, skills, attitudes that help people understand the different contours of violence, transform conflict, and work towards uh, negative and positive peace in the IEP sense, okay? So it's been recognized by UNICEF that, that, that peace education is a core component of quality education. So not just peace education, of any education. And it's also been recognized that it's also, um, peace education is a critical component of peace building work. I recently um, contributed to a report by the International Alert and um, British Council on Peace Education, and this built on some work done, uh, a peace poll a couple of years back, which um, involved about 100,000 different people in 10, 15 countries, both fragile, conflict-ridden countries and relatively peaceful countries, asking them what is needed in order to bring progress in the world. Um, and number two, governments came out that people thought that peace education was essential for making progress with regards to peace and security. So it, there's the, the, the importance. However, I will say this, there's quite a few arguments or critiques advanced against peace education. One is that often there's this disconnect between those that study peace and those that practice it in the field. So what, there's a real need to connect what happens in the classroom to what happens in the community. And, and um, we're gonna say how we wanna try and approach that. So there's a little bit about war, conflict and peace, but why young people? Why should we focus on young people and why now? Well, Gandhi said it best. If we wanna um, achieve real peace in the world, we've got to start with children and young people. So he said that a long time ago. However, so there's always been an interest in the role of young people in peace building. However, in the last five years, right now, there is an unprecedented level of interest in the role of young people in peace and security. There's been three UN resolutions in the last five years, which basically says governments, communities really need to change and step up their game and involve young people more in peace and um, security decision-making processes. There's one reason. 
Now we have more young people on the planet than ever before in the whole of history. Ever before, we have 3 billion under 30. It's the largest and fastest growing demographic on the planet. So obviously if we're not involving them, we're missing something. Um, here's the issue though. Young people still, despite these resolutions, despite all the great work that's happening, they still are too often seen as problems to be solved rather than problem solvers. And they're too often excluded from decision-making processes. So that needs to be addressed. So there's some benefits. And because we are working in collaboration with Rotary, it's worth thinking about well, what are some of the benefits of this project for Rotarians? Well, one is, and, and although this is a new project with regards to World Beyond War and Rotary Action Group for Peace working together, I've worked on many of these projects before, and we found that it, it helps to grow membership through inspiration. I can tell you now, no word of a lie, some of the projects I've done before, there was Rotarians who've been Rotarians for 40 years. So there was a married couple that comes to mind in particular. And I still remember them saying to me, Phil, we've been Rotarians for 40 years and working on this project with young people to train them as peace builders has been the most impactful thing we've done as Rotarians. Quote, I'm telling you, and I could have cried. I think I did when they told me, uh, when they said it to me, because it was very authentic. So it, it grows and so, it, inspiration um, it connects people but it connects them through action as well this project we know that a challenge worldwide for Rotarians is to grow membership is to engage um, more effectively with the community and we also know that Rotarians are interested in engaging more particularly with Interact Rotaract and the people thank you Rotary that you've trained us as the peace experts you know Rotary Peace Fellows we really want um we want to engage more Rotarians and Rotary Peace Fellows. And there's some good work being done along those lines, actually, which I can talk about later. So there's a little bit about the project. Um, but here's the question. What difference will the project make? Well, here's some ideas. And this is another great thing. So let's start with the end in mind. This is the end, this is the end goal of where we want to get to as, as, a, as a collective together here. Our ambition is to connect and support new generations of, and I first of all put young war abolishers and peace builders, but I took that young out because we really need to focus on intergenerational work. We really need to focus on training and supporting young people. We really need to focus on training and supporting older people as well. Um, it's not, so although the focus is on young people here, it's about intergenerational work. So that's why I took the kind of young out after. Here's a few things um, which people, and I'll say you know, what it can consists of this project, but here's a few things in terms of its value. One, you're gonna become part of a global network. Two, at the end of going through this project, so as people know with World Beyond War, through going through the peace education part of our courses, they get certified or a certificate of completion at the end. This will be a little bit different because it'll be going through a six week educational journey and then physically putting a peace project together. So at the end, people will become so both, there will be two different types of certification <clears throat> which will be signed on behalf of both Rotary Action for Peace and World Beyond War that certifies them as war um, abolitions and also peace builders. And what they'll have to do is justify that they've completed a project within a certain time that, is the, that, that uh, meets certain criteria. And I'll say something about that shortly. Another benefit is an opportunity to make a difference, um, actionable learning. So not just learning something for the sake of it, learning something for the sake of taking that learning, using that theory and putting it to practice to make a difference on the ground. Make that making a difference on the ground will connect to global goals. So what I mean is sustainable development goals, but do it at a local level. Um, you'll have an opportunity to work with two more actually because we're also in collaboration with WILF as well which is another um, uh, globally recognized organization so a number of globally recognized organizations access to award-winning materials so for those that know and work with us at World Beyond War we have very good educational materials and we've got you know global recognition for that um, widen your sphere of influence cross-cultural learning intergenerational work and also um, an opportunity to grow membership and impact. Before I, before I move on to the model, I really wanna kind of op open it up to, to Alison to kind of input, 
give a perspective of why you thought it was important, for, you know, to, to, for us to work together on this project. And I'm going to come off sharing the screen so people can see you. Um, just to say a few words, if that's okay, you know, just to say if, okay. what, drew, what drew you to this project, you know, why, why, why were you interested and why do you think Rotarians interact, Rotaract should get behind it? Well, I, I think one of the attractive things is we're, we're very much focused on positive peace. And I know that um, abolition of war could be seen towards the negative, but there is a balance in all these things and we need that balance. And we recognize, of course, that uh, any conflict situation is not a good situation. And there are just losers at the end. There are no winners, really. Um, and also, if you remember Rotary, I think at the core of Rotary are young people. We're all about young people. Look at the different programs that we offer. Look at the Peace Fellowship, the RILA, the leadership programs. And it's about developing uh, young people today and for the future. And I think um, the fact that this is also going to be cross-cultural, the fact that today I've counted we've got 16 countries on this call, that is a huge achievement on your behalf. And that's when we actually start joining together that we become stronger alone, we're, we're, we're weaker. And also I think it's not about competing with one another, it's about support and collaboration and working together and seeing what each person brings to the table. You all bring something to the table today. And I think that that's exactly what's happening with the RAG and with World Beyond War. I think that we're going to be beneficiaries from it. And the thing is today, I think it's important to remember that intergenerational is important. It's possible to have the two extremes within Rotary talking about, we need young people, we need to grow more clubs and so on. But that, that's a, a problematic because then you're dismissing the old people. If you reverse it, that's problematic. We need everybody. At the end of the day, when we recruit Rotarians, we're not recruiting Rotarians because of gender, because they're tall, long, thin, pink, blue, yellow, green. We're recruiting good Rotarians. This project is recruiting intergenerational support to actually make the difference in the world. I think that's it, Phil. I think that says why I'm on board and also working with you as well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you Alison thank you so much um okay thank you for yeah we've got some claps there claps thank you so so okay so let me share the screen again and then and I'm going to talk a little bit about well, what is this project and, and I think it's, it's useful to know the background it's also useful to to talk about the, <clears throat> the benefits as well but I've got to say one of the, the, the I mean, if we think of Tesla and organizations, they talk about, well, you've got to have a really good product first, you know, before selling it. And you've got to have a really good um, service as well. So let's say a little bit about, you know, what this project it consists of. So I put it here, model, how does it work? For those that might, so, so over the years, many years, including through the PhD and other places, I've been working on a model of how can we bring education and action together as well as research and advocacy but also young people as well in a way that puts young people at the center so this this project um i also developed further through um, another organization I, I that i helped to develop and work on new gen peace builders who use this model as well um with with them i just used it in the context of education and action but my broader work looks at those uh, research education action and advocacy so here's the kind of model, but we try and put young people at the center or people at the center, let's say, you know, so young people and adults working together on projects. So, well, what does that look like in practice? Well, in this, in our context, it means the Rotary Action for Peace and World Beyond War working together on a project that has two parts. So through this project, the project spans three and a half months altogether. And it, and it adopts a two-pronged approach to change making. One is peace education and two is peace action. Let's have a look at the peace education part. So part one takes 120 people through a six week online learning experience. The 120 people, the ambitious goal is that there will be 12 people from 10 different countries. 
And Alison, other Rotarians, uh, other staff members at World Beyond War and I have already been in conversation with many different countries who have expressed differing levels of interest, some that have the money and are ready, ready and raring to go and have young people and others we're in different conversations. But this is the idea to kind of have a conversation with you all today. So the idea is to have 12 from 10 different countries. 10 of them would be young people, 18 to 35. And the other two would be mentors that would work with young people alongside them through the journey. I'm gonna say something about that shortly. So the, the, the peace education part is online. So for those that, that work with us, and I, th I think I've seen John as well, who's one of our wonderful board members from World Beyond War. We, we um, have really good educational materials online um, and run six week um, online courses, which means that young people, adults can access the material in their own time, in their own way, whenever they want to. We suggest that between three and five hours is spent each week going through the educational material. The educational material will be a mix of written uh, material, videos, images, recordings, etc. So there's different ways of catering for different learning needs. But what happens? So we, we're splitting the project, the six week, into three different modules. Two weeks, look at the, the head of peace building. And I'll say something about that shortly. Two weeks, look at the heart of peace building. And two weeks, look at the hands of peace building, okay? Here's something I put together to try and make sense of it, of how, what I think of what, 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 what's really constitutes significant, effective education. We can't just work in the head. We have to work the whole person. So we're interested in the development of the whole person. So here's something I put together in terms of looking at int intellectual intelligence, emotional intelligence, and practical intelligence. One way of thinking about it is the knowing of peace building, the being of peace building, which I would say is definitely the, the most difficult and always ongoing, and the doing of peace building. Um, so what do we mean by the knowing? Well, what we do for two weeks, the first two weeks, is that it will revolve around our award-winning book, A Global Security System, which lays out a blueprint for ending war and establishing a just and sustainable peace where peace can be shewed by, by peaceful means. Drawing on Galton again. Um, this, these two weeks will look at uh, strategies for demilitarizing security. We need to take the money out of the war system. So how do we go about doing that? Another one, another, another part will look at managing conflict without violence. And these, these two, demilitarizing security and managing conflict are more of the hardware of the system. And then the, the second week, we'll look at the culture of peace perspective, which is more about the future orientation, more of the soft, soft skills side of things. In doing so, it's been argued, and, and I've argued this as well, that I think it's, to work in the peace building world, we need to have an understanding of four core concepts, conflict, violence, power and peace. So we'll look at them. What do we mean by conflict, violence, power and peace? And how, we, how can we go about um, engaging with these? So that's the first two weeks. Oh, here's our uh, blueprint that we lay out in the global security system. Then the next two weeks, we'll be looking at what we call ways of being with self and others. And this is really, really important in peace building. Often, it's, we, we're told to let's do work out there, you know, let's, let's get trained in conflict analysis and things like this. It's really important to turn the mirror inwards and look at yourself. So week three, we'll be looking at your development as a peace builder. You know, what brought you to do what you, you do today? You know, what is, what's your passion? What's your, what do you bring to the work that you do, et cetera? So that's week three. And then week four, we'll be looking at ways of being with others. This in a sense draws quite a lot from nonviolent communication. So how do we navigate relationships with authenticity, empathy, compassion, um, uh, understanding, prizing, et cetera. We also draw on, my, my background's also psychotherapy. So we draw on an approach called focusing, which is similar to mindfulness, but a little bit different um, to really look at ourself. Um, so this will also be covered in week three and four. And during this week, there'll be some really cool interactions between young people in different countries as well, which will be really cool. Um, and it's about listening as well. So we, we, we look at the, the practice, we practice the practice of listening. Then the, the last two weeks is, is, okay, how do we take this? And this is the, the practical intelligence, 
for some reason my PowerPoint's skipping. Um, how do we organize collectively? So week five, we'll be looking at how do we design and implement a project? Week six, we'll be looking at how do we monitor and evaluate that project? So it's about taking the learning and put it into practice. Along the way, we'll be looking at um, concepts by at least some, some leading uh, people in the field. Elise Balding talks about future envisioning. So we need to envision the world that we want to live in before we can think about planning projects to get us there. We'll look at this principle of do no harm. Um, often it's the case we want to rush out there and do these great projects. The first and foremost, we need to stop and make sure that this project does no harm. And then look that it does good. Uh, we'll look at ideas of conflict analysis, hybridity, friction, among others. So that is the peace education part, but it doesn't stop there. Many, 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 many people have been saying to us, we, and including people on the call now, um, how can we take this learning and how can we put it into practice in a supported way where we receive mentoring and work in collaboration? This is part two. In part two, what would happen is the teams in each country would then take their learning and they put together a peace project. They would have eight weeks to put together a peace project and they would work collaboratively where young people, we use this language, young people lead, adults guide. So it's an intergenerational collaboration People play different roles, people have different expertise and different worldviews, but they're collaborating and they, they learn from each other, okay? So across the six weeks, they'll put together a peace project. During those six weeks, this is the really, 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 really cool thing. I know Helen on the call has, has kind of said this would be really cool as well. Um, intergenerational, cross-cultural communities of practice is what we'll establish. So as the young people go through their projects for the eight weeks, they will have one team, and it could be called a country project team, which I'll say something about shortly. Um, so made up of 12, two adults, 10 young people. They would meet at least once a week, and it would, because of COVID, it would be online to do check-ins, to find out what the progress on their projects. As they move along, there would be support, and this links to kind of stewardship and accountability and monitoring and evaluation from um, an advisory board made up of the Rotary Action Group for Peace, Rotarians, others, and World Beyond War to support the mentors and the teams in each country. So we would provide overall um, oversight management on all the projects. Meanwhile, every two weeks, this is really cool. What would happen is that there would be opportunities for these different countries, the young people, to present their ongoing work and to learn from each other. So for example, we've got you know, high levels of interest, you know, Venezuela, Colombia, Kenya, for these countries, Canada, USA, India, for these countries, young people from each country to get together, to learn from each other, to listen to, to peace and conflict challenges in these different contexts with, with an idea of maybe thinking through, okay, how, how can this, how can I learn from the work that's being done in Colombia and perhaps, you know, apply it in elsewhere noting that all projects need to be context specific. So a peace project will look different in Colombia to what it, what it might do in India, for example. But, but we will set the framework and the framework will be along the lines of what we, show, what we showed later uh, earlier in the um, a global security system. We have the three broad categories. So a project would fall under demilitarizing security, managing conflict without violence and a culture of peace. So there's a framework to work within. Before I, before I go on and talk about the impact, I want to see who's on the, I know Annie's on the call. Um, I want to see if Manuela is on the call also and Alejandra and maybe Tara. Yes, Manuela. You've Manuela. got, um, I think, Uganda. Um, yeah, oh, no. Okay, so we've got, so what I'd like to do now, the, the, the reason why we're here, I, I mean, let's do a, sh Manuela, by the way, is one of the people, and she went like, is one of the people that really said to us, Phil, we really want to work with you at Will Be On War on a project and with Road to Action Group for Peace. So Manuela de deserves a lot of the praise here. So can we give a space, if, it, if it's okay for you, Manuela and, and Annie, um, to talk about what, about this project? You can say whatever you'd like to say, but one thing you might want to talk about is, why you're interested in this project, why this project is important in general and in your country. So we've got Manuela from Colombia, Annie from Venezuela. I, I can't see if Tarek is here yet, from Syria is yet. Um, if you are Tarek, let me know, but he might be on, on the call later. And also Christine from Kenya will be on the call later. So um, Manuela- and We have Kenya on the call. 
Oh, do we have Christine? Oh, Christine's here. Christine's yes, here also. We have. Great. I'm here. We have got some superstar young people. So, okay, Manuela, if you can go first, and then Annie, if you can go after, and then Christine, if you can go after, and just say a little bit about the importance of this project uh, and the support that you need from Rotarians and others to make this work and available to your context. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. I think that educating for peace in the world is a challenge and the greatest contribution of the education sector uh, to the process of social peace building. So peace is considered an essential human right to educate uh, towards a new ethic of and encourage and promote direct cultural and structural nonviolence. So in my country, for example, Colombia is currently facing an enormous and historic, historic uh, challenge to strengthen and appropriate peace. Mm, not only of the peace established in the agreements between the national government and the former FARC, but uh, of the struggle to ensure to all sectors of society can have uh, like political participation in the decision making of one of the elements that I consider initially fundamental to achieve a, a sovereign and more Democrat, demo, democratic country. So I think that everyone in the world should have the tools to achieve a more just world. Uh, that is why it's important to educate for peace. And this is a wonderful project for that reason. Thank you, thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you, Manuela. Annie, are you, are you there? Could you say a few words, please? Yes, absolutely, I'm here. I'm sorry. I'm can't turn my camera on right now. Um, but I am from, from Venezuela and what I just wanted to point out that was that um, there are countries like Colombia and Venezuela and Syria that we are going through really, really hard um, situations right now. And in my particular case in Venezuela, we have the second largest refugees crisis after Syria and we are not in a war and, and we are one of the most violent countries in Latin America. And we will ever have the opportunity to receive this kind of information and guidance and, and education is really important. And there are a lot of people that's working through peace without the information and the tools and having the opportunity to connect through the internet with high level um, professionals like you guys in, in people in Venezuela working through peace. It's, it's gonna be a great opportunity for us to grow and for us to show uh, what we're doing and, and learn from everybody. So I think, and the fact that young people and, and right now, um, there's a lot of immigration and there's really few people that still in, in Venezuela working and supporting them. It's a, you know, in a, a task that it's really, really, really important for us right now. I think it's, you know, really, um, it's a huge, huge help that Venezuela can receive. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, Annie. Thank you. Um, and so, so can I just do a bit of a shout because how, how humble Manuela and Annie are. Let's just give a bit of a context of these wonderful young people. So Annie, can you just say a little bit about, um, and then Manuela next, about um, your, you've just been asked by Rotary International to be on a particular advisory group and you're only one of a, a, no, a handful of young people around the world that have been asked. And if you could say something about your Rotary um, the quarantine project as well, Annie, please, just to give people a bit of a context. Absolutely. So um, I was a Rotary Youth Exchange student in 2019, 2020 in the United States. And because of COVID and the pandemic, I got stuck here in the country. So when the when COVID start, we start a network of interact students and youth exchange students from all over the world. Uh, we initially just wanted to meet and see what everybody was doing. And we ended up doing a conference where Miss Allison helped us. And we had, you know, President uh, Mark Maloney at a time and President Colger Kanak and an astronaut from NASA. So from that experience, uh, 
we develop the network called Rotary Interactive Quarantine. We are 600 students right now from 60 different countries. And we are the biggest representation, I will say, of Interact and Youth Exchange right now. And I think because of that uh, experience, I was asked by President-elect Cheka Meta to serve in a, the first ever Interact Advisory Council. That will, it will be made up of uh, five Interact students and two Interact advisors. I'm going to be one of the Interact alumni um, that's going to be helping the council next year. I'm really excited for that. Wow, yes. So that gives a bit of a perspective on who the wonderful, you know, young people, and we'll say, Emanuele, you can go next as well. So, you know, and, and, and I can say we are so, so fortunate to have Annie and Manuela and Christine, who's going to speak next, as, as basically playing a leadership role on our World Beyond War Youth Network. They are doing an amazing job and it's wonderful to, to kind of work with them. And I will say something um, about mentoring as well, that it's, it, it's also two way as well. So as, as, as adults and, and younger people work together, adults will be there as a mentor. But I'm telling you now, there will be a wonderful learning experience for the adults as well to learn a lot from the young people. Annie, you know, Manuela and Christine as three wonderful examples. So Manuela, can you say a little bit about yourself in terms of, yeah, maybe Road Track for Peace and other things that you do in Colombia? Yes, of course. Thank you. Uh, okay, I participate in a Positive Peace here in Colombia. And I led a project that called Culture of Peace. And I work like uh, five years, something like that in, in that project in my country. Uh, then I participate in, a, in the first World Peace Conference with Rotaract for Peace when I met Alison and she helped us uh, so much in, in that conference. Also this year, uh, I will be Rotaract District representative in my district in Colombia. Uh, so I want to work a lot in, in peace because, because I am interested in that. And I think that in my country, it is necessary for that. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Manuela. Okay, so now we'll, can we, uh, Christine, are you that, so I've got to say Christine is another superstar as well. So, um, you know, watch this space. So Christine's from Kenya. Um, and can you t t give a little bit of a perspective on, on your work and, um, you know, including what you do for you know, Commonwealth Secretary, et cetera, um, and your work around youth peace and security? Christine and hopefully I can tell well actually I hope for also Annie and Manuela as well but I know Christine will be applying as well um, future Rotary Peace Fellows so we remember that this project is an opportunity to incubate future Rotary Peace Fellows too and I know that Tarek will go next as well from Syria so Christine are you are you there please yes Phil I'm here Thank you so much. I love the energy. I love the enthusiasm that you keep showing and mentoring us. So thank you, Phil, for everything you do and everyone on the call. My name is Christine Odera. I am a youth peace and security um, advocate here in Kenya, as well as within the Commonwealth. I currently serve as the global coordinator for the Commonwealth Youth Peace Ambassadors Network which is a network of young peace builders from the grassroots, national, uh, regional, and pan-commonwealth. And what we do, we mostly upscale young peace builders' voices um, to platforms where they are able to also uh, make the change happen. You know, As Phil was talking about being the head, the heart, and the hands, we're also trying to make sure that everyone is included because what you realize is a, long, a lot of young people and especially, uh, let me now get a bias of Kenya. In Kenya, we have suffered, and I mean, mostly in Africa, we have suffered civil wars, which continue to inhabit um, our experiences in peace processes, our experience in living peacefully because ethnic violence is still one of the major issues that we continue to face. Every five years, when it comes to an election period, we still have um, all this violence emanating from um, electoral um, processes. So as young people, we're just tired of being excluded 
And as the missing report um, suggests, the violence of exclusion has been one of the things that as young people, we're just tired of, and we're not waiting to be included. Right now, we're trying to make sure that um, we're able to be part and parcel of the changes that we want to see. Most of the time, what you realize is we don't get to be invited into decision-making platforms. We are not part of the peace processes that are happening within our countries. So in this case, a project like what the World Beyond War is doing in collaboration with other, um, other organizations is not only going to amplify the voices of young people, but it's going to make sure that young people are not working in silos. And the conversation is taken where it really matters. A lot of young people really are passionate about peace processes and being included into peace work, but we don't have the know-how. So how then do we start capacity building young people into some of these mechanisms, right? How do we make sure that uh, we capacity build young people in peace processes? Just how then do you package yourself when it comes to the languaging in peace processes. When you talk about nonviolence engagement, how then do you package yourself in a nonviolence um, engagement? The one issue we've also been facing is when it comes to donors, a lot of us young people do not understand how to even report a financial report. So how then do we get um, organizations like World Beyond War that has very good research on that, helping us help ourselves? And like Phil was mentioning, it's then become an intergenerational conversation that is not necessarily in support of only the young people, but also the older generations. Um, Phil, I can keep talking. Please cut me whenever you are ready. <laughs> no, th thank you. Thank you, Christine. And there's, there's going to be more time as well. We're going to allow at least, hopefully, 20, 25 minutes for questions, answers, etc. So thank you, Christine. Christine's another wonderful young people that we are so fortunate to be to be working with, learning from. You know, every single time I hear actually Manuela, Annie, and Christine speak, I'm like, I'm busy writing notes and just learning so much. So we are so fortunate to be working with them. So thank you. And and speaking of another great young person, Tarek, are you there? And now I know there's often issues with Syria, uh, with with the camera and things like this. But I think I've seen you. If you are there, yes, could you? Yes, he is here. Perfect. Yep. Can, can you can you say a little bit about, um, you know, why you think this project is important and, and, and why Rotarians and others should get behind the project to try and make it available for young people and adults, um, you know, in, in, in different places, please. Yeah, cool. So hello, everyone. My name is Tarek. Uh, I'm a dentist and also an activist living in Syria. Uh, there is no doubt, I guess, you're you all know that you know Syria is the biggest emergency that ever happened since World War II, and I'll spare you the numbers, but uh, there is no doubt that's been there a uh, war for around ten years now, and the consequences are massive uh, on each and every scale. Um, I guess this program, um, and I really hope that somehow it gets to Syria, uh, would give a rare opportunity for people living in, inside the country to have some kind of education on peace building because um, we don't uh, need just the, to call out uh, to stop um, you know, military actions. We also need to rebuild peace between the different components of the Syrian society. The crisis itself led us into too many different smaller crises, crises and also led to polarizing the society in a way. Uh, so it's really difficult that even I'm pretty sure now if we say that war is over here, it would take a lot of time between different um, people, different stratas of the society to rebuild this harmony together, which is really unfortunate and sad. Uh, coming from person, I'm, I'm, I'm living through this for a while now. Um, I guess this program um, would give uh, youth the opportunity to do something regarding this. I myself uh, know a lot of people who are very, very um, keen and interested in changing this. Uh, very complicated issues and contributing to solving this, even like by small bits. That would be, you know, a good start for us. As you may or may not know, but we are 
we don't have that many acts, uh, many uh, opportunities to access when it comes to education because of the US sanctions, even Zoom, I need to do some uh, tech stuff to, to get on Zoom because I can't really uh, get on it like as you probably do. Uh, so it's really, uh, I, I guess, a rare opportunity definitely for, for youth uh, to have this uh, mentorship as you Phil mentioned, I mean, mentorship uh, goes both ways because in, what, in one way, you, we, we would uh, benefit from the experience, but in another way, um, we would also be uh, showing those mentors how is the situation really is in Syria. I mean, you probably all go on media, but it's a totally different story uh, when, you are, when you live through this on a daily basis. So I really hope that uh, Syria would be included in the program and I look forward to promoting it and also applying to this opportunity when, when it comes online, definitely. Uh, so thank you all. Thank you, I want Tara. to say something. Phil, can I say something? Please, yeah. Um, with the young people who've spoken today and there's others on here who've not spoken, I think it's very rare in Rotary that we get to see the plants fully grown or growing. We sow seeds all of the time. And I think what it's doing for us today is we're very privileged to see the impact of the connection that we've already made with these young people, the things that can happen. Imagine if we can actually multiply this again and again, which is why you're all on the call, why you're on from different countries. Just think of the effect that that's going to have. Look at the three exceptional people we have. And even thinking of what Tarek's just said from Syria, um, another initiative on the RAG, we're working together with Karim Wasfi in Iraq, and he wants to bring peace and beauty to that place through music. And there's some activity going along there to do that. There are many ways of peace building and we need to equip everyone. So this is why it's important for us all to be connected. Thank you, Alison. Thank you, yes. And uh, thank you to, to Tarek, to Christine, to Manuela, to Annie. And, and like, and like um, yeah, Alison said, there's other wonderful young people that are, that are on the call as well. So a shout out to all of the young people that are on the call from the World Beyond War Youth Network that the young people themselves are putting together and leading on. It's not about World Beyond War staff deciding. Young people are now working out what the process should be, what the purpose should be, what the activities should be, what they want to engage in, etc. cetera. So um, I know Ava's on the call. I know Liber's on the call. If I've missed others, uh, apologies. But, um, um, but Baba also from, from Gambia so, um, are on the call. So we've got a, a yeah, great um, cohort of young people on the call. So um, thank you for being with us. And, and Helen, I, I didn't kind of ask you, or I didn't want to put you on the spot, but um, I'm going to. Uh, Helen Peacock, <laughs> um, can I just ask you a quick question? Because I know that one of the things you were really interested in and you thought was really kind of unique and really um, inspiring and w w should be really cool, is if, if there's an opportunity for young people from different countries to get together and engage. Can you say something about why you thought that was so important? And please tell us who you are as well. I know, and that would be great. Oh, okay, um, I'm Helen Peacock from Canada and a Rotarian and a member of World Beyond War. And um, Canada is one of the most peaceful countries in the world right now. And yet we, um, we have, um, I, I believe we have the motivation, we see ourselves as peace builders in the world. And I feel that for the young people, we've already assembled a group in Canada. People are so keen here on this project. And for, we've got um, people from, we have native Canadians on our team. We've got young people on our team. We've got, by young, I mean 15, and I have to talk to you about that. And they are so excited that they might be able to talk to someone in Kenya or talk to someone in Colombia and, and, and kind of understand what it's like to be 18, year old, 18 years old and growing up in a completely different um, culture and environment than theirs. It's like, um, it's like an opportunity to, to travel. It's like um, an exchange program from, from your own um, home. So I actually sat down and worked out all the countries that we thought um, might be able to participate in the project and discovered that between seven in the morning and eight in the morning, Eastern Standard Time, everybody else will also be awake all around the world, no matter what country they come from. It might be 10 o'clock at night 
but they will be awake. So I was, I sent this to Phil saying, um, you know, let's as much as we can facilitate the opportunity for our young people to be able to talk with each other as part of this project. I also think that um, they will be, they are very interested in what other countries are actually doing and would like to be cheerleaders for um, projects outside of Canada as well as what we do in Canada. Thank you, Helen, thank That's you. the right moment to pose, is that the right moment to pose the question that we have to pose um, in terms of the June or September? Because um, Helen mentioned timing. Yes, yes. We were all geared up and ready to go in February. <laughs> I know you were. I know you were, Helen. I know. Apologies. So in the spirit of transparency, uh, so uh, Alison had done a wonderful job of working it through the MOU, um, and it was a lot of work. Um, so thank you to you, Helen, for being patient with us. That is a good, that is a good, a good opportunity to, you know, to pose the question, perhaps um, a list of questions that we had, you know, June, September, what is doable? But bef actually, before actually answering that, let's, let's say a little bit about what participation participation looks like and what it would look like in each particular country um and i and along those lines as well and i think i've seen sarah i wanted so if you could see sarah reed she has a really cool she told me what it was the other day and i'm really bad with technology but it was a bio what did you call it sarah bio bio something you with your cool image um it's a bit the lady in the room. what is it a bit moji, I'll put it there in the There we are, a bit moji. So I want to do a shout out to you, Sarah, as well, because you've been really helpful in your comments into in helping to shape the work that we're doing has been really useful as well. So I just wanted to kind of offer a bit of a space for you to say something. I know Jackie, your colleague that you work very closely with, is on the call as well, to say something about, you know, that this project and the importance and things like this before I talk about um, what participation looks like in different places, because through conversation, we understand that we're in discussions and the, the, the discussions that we're in in different countries are at different stages so we we want to be flexible to be to open it up to different countries so i'll say something about that shortly but but sarah yeah if you could say something about um you know what we've been working on well, i don't have a lot to add but i do think the intergenerational component and the uh networking component uh between countries uh but also between uh, generations, and if we do have countries with more than one community uh, between communities and very important, you can tell just from the people who've talked so far that uh, everyone's going to start at a different place and our ability to learn from that and uh, uh, figure out a better way of quickly diagnosing what uh, needs might be present and what uh, interventions uh, strengthen peace uh, is information we can share, which will really, uh, I think, boost progress over time as this program grows through uh, more than one iteration, because the plan is not for it to be a one and done 120, uh, but for it to uh, build on itself so that we have cohorts from year to year. Yes, and that was a very good point. So, so uh, as Sarah said, said, so the idea is that it acts as a model. This is a pilot now. We're in a sense one of the benefits here is that you have an opportunity to be part of history. I know it sounds very corny when I say it, but you really do because we're, 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 this is a pilot project that we're putting together and working together as a collaboration. The idea is that it acts as a, as a model year in year out. So. Alison, how many people have you had come through as, you know, the um, Rotary Action Group for Peace this year? Um, and you, I remember you saying, I remember you saying, this is great because, they're, you know, the young people that come in are always looking for something to do, a project, something action orientated. This is the answer, Phil, you know. So can you say something about that, Alison? I think, I think um, COVID actually has a silver lining. I don't say that lightly for everyone who's suffered and lost loved ones and lost employment and housing, but it's enabled us to meet as we're meeting today. We couldn't do this. We'd have to wait to the convention in the hope that each one of us could afford to go there to meet face to face. Okay, I can't give you a hug, but I send you all good wishes from Wales. It's, it's still there. You can still connect. And because we recognize that we started something called Chat with the Chair from March, and uh, Phil and I do Monday, which is Youth Voice. Now, as a result of that, 
um, we have actually piloted three new chapters of the RAG. And from all of this, I anticipate that we have an additional 200 members. We have at least 50 to 60 peace builder clubs come out of it, at least 100 people through the Peace Academy. We set up the Rotaractors for Peace, which was a sort of side thing, um, involved with Annie with interactive quarantine. This one, um, Iraq, multiple other things. So what I'm trying to give you is that the connectedness, it is possible as well to grow membership because I think it's not possible to grow membership by everyone recognizing we're such a great organization. We've got this great rating as a charity, etc. No, it's actually the projects that we do that attract people, isn't it? Which is why you're here today. And then it's who we are underpinning those projects that keep people. And it's that. And I think there's such huge opportunities for, for this. And I think also it's not just um, as a, even as a district governor, I'm not concerned with numbers. I'm actually much con more concerned with quality and quality for me is about people. It's about people being taken care of and valued. And when you do that, they grow in number because they recognize that they are valued. And I think there's multiple people out there in all walks of life that will come across what we're doing and think, we want to do this or we want to do something similar. I am sold on it, Phil, as you can tell. <laughs> well, I just like, I could cry because like listening to Alison, that's the reason why I love working with Alison because you could tell this is very authentic. She really cares about what she's doing, you know, like you all do on the call. So um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. I know we've got about 20, a bit more than 25 minutes. What I wanted to do is share the impact and share specifics around, well, how do I get involved with this? And then open it up for questions and answers that we have from you, because we really want to use this as an opportunity to hear from you. You are the experts on the ground. You know what, what's needed you know, on the ground. So we really want to hear from you. So can you put your thumbs up and say, if you can see, the, um, if you can see my screen? Yes, Phil. Perfect. So impact. So what's if we start, if we begin with the end in mind, what do we want to see at the end of this pilot project? Well, here's some ideas. So Sarah spoke about, you know, this building of the community. Here's some other specifics. And I've put them under education, action and communication. Under the education part, the idea is to take to strengthen the local capacities of 120 people in 10 different countries. And we will assist them in terms of their peace building co competencies in terms of their critical analysis and research, because in order to do a peace pro project, they will have to justify that that project's needed. Um, we will also support them in terms of their organizing and their project management skills, transferable skills that are not just applied to peace building, but very, very applicable to, to life in general and to you know, getting jobs and things like this. Their digital and technology um, capabilities, because, because we'll be interacting via Zoom, via Canvas, via other platforms. And then finest, finally, their, their leadership abilities and networks. These are the ideas um, under the education part. Under the action part, the idea is to finish the project with 10 or more social action projects that is, that is designed to increase, and, and um, Christine spoke about this, increase the meaningful participation of young people in peace building work. That young people are participating all the time, but they're often seen as kind of sources of data if we think about research or the recipients of interventions that adults put together for them. No, the idea of this one is to increase the meaningful of participation so that young people are put front and center of these projects uh, with the support of, you know, um, trained adults. Um, also, the idea is to influence peace building from the bottom up. There's a lot of research that shows, of course, you know, elite level discussions have a role to play. But if it, there's a lot of research that looks at actually bottom up and grassroots peace building is really what counts because that's where you build in the ownership. And then after they've done the projects, they will present in their community. And this is an opportunity to present the projects to the wider community, where the wider community get a sense of what the projects are. They get a sense of who Rotary are, and this is a great opportunity to recruit as well. Um, so with another hat on before World Beyond War with the, um, the other organization I helped to develop and worked on, New Gen Peace Builders, we did two of these community events where I lived in Argentina 
uh, with, with the executive director also. Um, and there was 800 people, um, 300 at the first one, 500 at the second. So a great opportunity for bringing people together. Here's the big question you're all asking, but how do I participate? Well, in broad terms, there's three roles people can play in broad, 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 broad terms. And the good thing is, is that we have quite a few district governors here, which we think would probably be, or peace building chairs would be the coordinators. And these would be the people that would basically, in a sense, facilitate and make it happen in each of the countries, play a leadership role in terms of securing funding for the scholarships for young people to go through the program. Um, the mentors, adults won't pay to go through the program because they will be volunteering their time to act as mentors. The coordinators would also um, recruit both the young people and the, the, the mentors from each of the countries, so each of the locations. And they would work with the Rotary Action Group for Peace and World Beyond War to put together an end of project um, event. So that's the coordinators. And then you've got the mentors. So the mentors would sign up to going free of charge through the six weeks of educational um, training. And by the way, I should have said this, but the six weeks will have some really superstar facilitators. We have a facilitator for each week. Um, so they will be a mix of people from World Beyond War and also Rotary Peace Fellows, doctor, PhDs, um, with skill set in peace, with a skill set in psychotherapy, with a skill set in organizing, et cetera. So they're really top notch kind of facilitators. They would go through the six weeks and then they would agree to work on a weekly basis with the young people. Um, it's, it's work. I'll be authentic and be honest. It's work, but it's very, very rewarding work, you know, to work in collaboration with young people. And then, of course, the um, the, the, the third role is the young people themselves, you know, the young people. And, and, and Helen raised something before about, I know, I know we've been in conversations about this, Helen, as well. We, we think, you know, the focus would be 18 to 35. But if you think you've got wonderful young people that would be able to engage in this project, you know, let's have a conversation. We really want to be as, you know, uh, open uh, um, as we can and be as inclusive to, to open up to as many young people as possible. But then it, we brought this down and, and this was, uh, I do a shout out to Sarah, that, that Sarah and I kind of worked through this um, idea with Alison and others the other day. We're at different stages with different countries. So for example, some countries have said, we wanna put together a centralized country project team made up of 14 people. And the 14 people will be two coordinators two mentors and 10 young people. So say for example, the US, for example, and Houston. So what would happen is that the coordinator would say, yeah, we really wanna be part of this project um, and we can recruit the young people and, and everything. And actually we wanna recruit everybody from Houston area. And that would be a centralized team. Then another option, is that it would be decentralized in country teams. So for example, I know Live is on the call from India. Um, people from India might say, we really want to be part of this team. We can get 10, but we can't get them from this particular city. What we'll do is get three from this city and four from this city. So they'd be, they'd be I've just come up with these terms, decentralized in-country teams. And that's fine as well. And then the other one is that, you know, maybe it connects to the likes of Tarek, you know, or other people that, that might not get 10 people from the whole country, but they really want to work on this project. And then that then opens it up for, okay, could there be a decentralized multiple country team? So a couple, you know, a couple from Syria, a couple from Uganda, et cetera, work on projects together overall is one way of thinking about it. And then another idea for, for, for people that are from particularly World Beyond War or others is that if you're interested, there would be country project mentors, but then there would be outside mentors as well as a way of, getting insight both from the country and from outside the country. So the mentors would be responsible for kind of being resources and, and giving, providing feedback on the projects as the projects move along. So you're asking, is there a cost? Well, yes, we're good to let you know there's a cost. So to make it as accessible for as many people as possible, and this has been discussed with, you know, Road Traction Group for Peace, Rotarians, World Beyond War, we really want to keep the, the cost as cost effective as possible to $200 for each student to go through the whole program. 
So $100 for P the Peace Education six weeks and $100 for the eight weeks of Peace Project Mentoring. To be accountable and transparent, the $100 covers us putting the, the whole program together and everything that goes with that um, in terms of the, the content, in terms of the facilitators, in terms of using the platform that we use, et cetera, for part one. Part two involves the advisory board will be on what overseeing each of the projects and providing feedback on a weekly basis on each of the projects, which is, of course, is labor intensive as well. Um, and there might be a question of, well, what are you doing to, to check, to, to, to build in what we call feedback loops with regards to evaluation, with regards to being accountable, with regards to, as Sarah would use the language, good stewardship. We will, to ensure this, the accountability is built in and to ensure that the projects on the ground are being accountable to the people they purport or, or aim to serve, um, we will have an advisory board, which will basically provide feedback and, and um, act as what we call validation groups for each of the projects. Um, so there's, there's a question. Some information um, before we kind of open up to questions is that we will be having application forms. We will be in contact again already. We want to say right away, if you're interested in this project, please write your email address in the chat. Please reach out to Alison and I, and I'll show you the, 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 um, the email address shortly. And we will follow up with you because what we want to do over the next couple of weeks is really firm up who are, the, who are the countries that are going to be engaging in this work. Here's a bit of a timeline. We want to start the recruitment in April finish kind of mid-May. The recruitment will, will consist of application forms, which we've put together that we will send out. And then what would happen is that each country team, so for example, Helen or whatever, with, with Richard would get together and they'd look through the applications and they would say, okay, we've got 30 applications, young people, but we can only come up with 10. And they'll come up with 10 based on, we've got a criteria as well in terms of, you know, is leadership experience, interest, have they got a background in peace and conflict, et cetera. Um, and that's how the, how the decisions would be made in terms of, you know, the project. And then we'd hope to start, but this is something we want to raise with you in June um, and then finish mid September, which is where the community events would be, the community celebrations. Um, Alison, anything I forgot? Yeah, anything I, I think... I think what we need to do, we, we, we know we've got the question of when to start, but I think we need um, a bit more um, unpacking around the costs because we've had a number of comments. And, and one of the comments is that $200 in some countries is a huge amount. Another comment is for some, um, we heard from Tarek in Syria, access to the internet to Zoom is difficult. Another comment that um, some of the young people may not have computer access. Mm -hmm. Somebody said, well, maybe they could do it on their telephones. I responded to one of those comments saying that possibly this first time round that we hear all of those difficulties and we would like to address them, but we may not go in um, straight away with all of those areas because we we'll probably go with the easy route of where, we, where it's doable so that we can refine it and work on how we can overcome the other problems thereafter. Another comment was, what about stipends, etc.? cetera? Um, so we need to just unpack this costing fill and unpack the fact that we're thinking that maybe some countries, districts will have the money, others we will look to individual Rotarians maybe to sponsor a student. Do you want to unpack that? Yes, great questions. Thank you so much, everyone, for the for the great questions. So let's. So I was writing these down. So with regards to the cost in terms of uh, unpacking, so we've put a budget together and we'd happily send it over to you. But if we take in uh, one hundred dollars, one hundred dollars is based on the cost of um, the usual courses that we run at World Beyond War. And I should have said this to you, and I will say it to you actually. But we run four courses last year. Each each were attended by over a hundred. We're now running a course now. War Abolition 101, which some people are on, we have 150 on the course. And talking about intergenerational collaboration, how about this for cool? The youngest that I know of is 11. The oldest that I know of is 94. So how about that for intergenerational collaboration? So unpacking the costs, the cost covers putting, um, putting together all the content for the whole of the six weeks 
in terms of um, everything that goes into that, in terms of building the course online, in terms of all of the preparation and work that's already been done in terms of putting this project together. Stipends, I'm not too sure if, if what you mean, but stipends go to the facilitators as well in terms of who facilitates each of the six weeks. So that's where the $100. The question around um, $100 is, might be a lot in some places. That's a good valid question. You know, that's a good point. Um, and what we've, and this has been thanks to guidance by the Rotarians, we're aware that you know Rotarians in some countries have more money than other Rotarians in other countries. So um, what we'd be looking for is is Rotarians because we know you're generous. We know that you're interested in in engaging in this work to prov to provide sponsorship for other young people from different countries. So for example, and this might connect into the internet one. We work all the time with um, you know South Sudan and and other countries. Um, that cannot provide the scholarship. So what happens is that other people from other countries will provide scholarships for people from South Sudan to participate in, 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 the, um, in the project. And that goes links to internet connection. That's another good point in terms of some countries might not have good internet connection. But we find, and I mean, Tarek's on the call as well right now. We, we work all the time with South Sudan, Afghanistan, et cetera they all manage to access internet and engage online with our Canvas online platform. That is our experience that we got so far. Um, we run four courses last year and there was over a hundred on each of them from many different parts of the world. So that's just our experience. Um, I don't know, Tarek, if you want to say something because I don't want to talk for you or you, know, you, you, you have mentioned the internet sometimes is an issue, but can you say something about that? Yes, please. Uh, regarding uh, access to internet and laptops here in Syria, um, I would say that a good amount of people, uh, a good number of people here have access to a laptop. However, sometimes it could be tricky to access some websites and some software, but I guess throughout, I mean, it's, ten, it's been 10 years, so I guess most of us youth developed a way around to go uh, on those kind of websites. I mean, Canvas is in fact unaccessible for us Syrians due to the U.S. sanctions, but we also managed our way around to get in there as, as much as Zoom, you know, just to be clear. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that most youth now are, um, are able to access uh, all websites and all platforms uh, because, you know, we developed our own ways throughout the years. Thank you. Thank you, Tarek. So I hope, hopefully we've attempted to address, and this is the first of many information sessions. We cannot cover everything on this first one. Um, so hopefully we've attempted to, you know, to, to address, in, you know, an attempt to address the costs, what that covers, um, projects, uh, internet access, uh, stipends, anything else that we could, we could cover? We've had something from Raju, which mm. suggests maybe a small amount given to the mentors as an encouragement, but actually that isn't possible. Those mentors are going to be Rotarians. We cannot fund ourselves in any shape or form. So um, we're looking for service here. So I think that's a definite no, I'm afraid. Yeah, and, and based, based on experience. So although this will be the first time we'll be on World Rotary Action Group for Peace, I've done probably about 20 of these projects, you know, over, over the years where, where they've all been volunteers and it hasn't just been Rotarians, it's been um, university lecturers, school teachers, social workers, people for Save the, Save the Children, Red Cross, NGO workers, they've all been volunteers. So we're in the spirit of, you know, voluntary work here. And the reason, I mean, if you think about it, I'll be completely honest now that, you know, the, the cost of $200, bearing in mind the quality of the educational work that we produce is peanuts in comparison to some of the other projects that you see that get funded for a lot of money. Uh, we, we have behind us a wonderful award-winning globally recognized educational material that, that, is, that is very, very, very strong. Um, and actually I can show you just very quickly about that, just to kind of highlight how strong we are. Um, and, and while you're I, doing you... that let me answer um, Helen she asked why we changed the age range 18 to 35 uh, because originally we had lower the reason we did that Helen is because in some countries we have difficulties working online with what considered vulnerable and young people under 18 are vulnerable and need guardians and parental consent 
So again, we thought because this is the pilot um, and maybe we could be criticized, but we thought we'd go for um, the straightforward route this first time out so that we could get it out there and learn and then remedy these factors as we go. And particularly as Anne is concerned about equity and accessing platforms used, etc. We are conscious of that and we thank you for that. Um, but again, we might just go for the easy route the first time just to get launch it. Yes, you have a great saying, and I like your saying, Alison, something start with the greatest uh, chance of success, right? Yes. Which I think is a very, very good one. And, and Anne, on, on your point, and Helen, we're, we're aware as well that the first time around will be in English. Um, and we're aware of that. So, you know, all we can say is that we're starting something new, very exciting. And the aim moving forward is to have it in different languages, but we're at the starting place. So we want to really use this as a learning laboratory. And what a great opportunity for you to be on board to help us kind of shape this. Something about our educational material. So the one we're offering masters and PhD level materials and, and educational resources adapted to young people. You know, we can adapt it accordingly. Um, we have on our programs, and here's some of the pictures, you know, right from high school, right to PhD, who find it really, really accessible, um, you know, to go through the program. And, um, and I think we've, you know, we, we said that we've won, we've won, you know, various awards for our educational work. It's some, some things worth saying about um, the educational work is that, here is some of the people that have helped inform some of our educational work. Now, here is some of the leading thinkers in the peace and building field. You know, so um, we've got our wonderful colleague who's the coordinator for the Global Campaign for Peace Education, Tony Jenkins, who will be one of the facilitators of the week. We have uh, um, Ambassador Chowdhury, who was the, the brains behind the, the um, culture of peace movement within the UN. You have um, Cora Wise, who's at the Hague Appeal for Peace. You have some of the leading thinkers and names, practitioners within peace, peace and conflict studies fields that you'll have an opportunity to engage with some of them through this program. That is our unique selling point, I would say, over others. You know, where there's great programs out there, great, great programs, wonderful. I think our unique selling points are the, the combination of education and action, the combination of cross-cultural collaboration, the combination of intergenerational work, and, and also the fact of our educational material is very, very strong. Phil, um, I have another point, and then I see Audely, Odile has her hand up, but um, we, it's important for us to have your contact details because after this meeting, we'll send you a link whereby you can go on the link and register your interest, mm -hmm. interest in becoming a mentor, interest in putting names forward, interest in sponsoring one person or maybe 10 persons, whatever. So, and also we recognize Raju suggested as did Sarah Reed before crowdfunding, et cetera. We're open to all ethical ways of fundraising for this. Would you like to take um, Audley's question before we finish, Phil? Yes, and, and just thank you, Alison. Yeah, just uh, so just to let everybody know, Alison's uh, um, email and mine are now in the chat. So please reach out to us, you know, with interest. So Odil, so Odil is, is part of our uh, World Beyond War team. So great to see you. No, I heard, hello, hello everyone. I heard that in Syria, Canvas is not available due to the US sanction. So, what can you do then if you cannot use Canvas for Syria? Maybe Tarek can say something about that because he's on our course right now. So, Tarek, <clears throat> do you want to say something about that? Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, in fact, Canvas is not accessible as much as many other websites. Uh, so there are two ways of getting around this. The first one is for us Syrians is to go and have a VPN or, or kind of a proxy to go and access the website like I'm doing it from the US, the UK, Germany, any other country, basically. The other thing uh, that some companies have used in the past, um, if they will, is to apply to be excluded from the sanctions. So they apply, Canvas themselves apply to the US government saying that, look, we are not dealing with any suspicious activity whatsoever. So we would just be able, we would like to, to, to have the permission to act, to give uh, Syrians access. But unfortunately, not a lot of um, companies or websites do care about Syrians. 
So that's why, you know, some of them just would rather uh, stick to the sanctions as much as they exist. Thank you. I think, um, Odile, that we will work closely with individuals like Tariq and others who are bringing to our attention problem areas so that they might help us resolve them going forward. Bill, before we finish, we've got to resolve June or September. Yes, and, and in, doing, in, in doing that, so let's, let's open it up. But I want to, Dirk, you're a very active Rotarian. Um, and I, we, we really like to kind of hear your comments as well with regards to what you think about the project. And in doing so, maybe you could say something about June or September. Uh, no, first of all, uh, this project is uh, fascinating and so important. As you know, uh, I always try to push youth because they are the future and they are going to run this world. So, uh, and for Ukraine with uh, the country getting into the eighth year of war now, time is flying, uh, it, it is double interesting. Uh, we will have an issue, of course, with the, with the cost that I totally agree is not high. So uh, we will, but of course it is high for Ukraine. $200 is a lot of money in Ukraine, but uh, I think we need to find solution for this. Uh, either by asking some friend districts, I don't know, Switzerland, Germany, where definitely people are economically stronger to maybe sponsor some, some uh, young Ukrainians. We had a Ryla in Ukraine two years ago and the cost was also $200. Yeah. So uh, it, it, is, it is a cost you can live with. It was a full package with, with a, a hotel and everything. From the date, uh, we are just starting here the third wave of uh, COVID. And just while we were having this, this meeting now, uh, our district has cancelled all the activities, DTS, pets, pets for Rotaract, uh, postponed, not cancelled, postponed for one month, was supposed to happen this weekend because we're having uh, 15 plus thousand cases per day. So, of course, uh, I think September looks more, and we just start vaccination. I mean, in Europe, you're much ahead with vaccination. We are very, very much behind with vaccination. We just got 500,000 uh, doses. And from those 500,000, uh, we just uh, injected 100,000. So Ukraine is 40, 000, uh, 40 million people. So uh, June looks quite early for us. So September might be better, but who knows? Okay, so a lot. Oh, thank you, Dirk. Thank you. So along those lines, can we let's do a bit of um, practicing democracy here? Why don't we um, write in the in the chat? Uh, or just June, do this. June or September. Oh, oh, I can't see you. Alternatively, we could count hands. We could say June, and you've got to do this, and I'll go through the screen, and then we can say, say September. Okay, let's do this. But we got it. We got a people yep. to put their cameras on. Oh, and, and so um, right. as well. All right. So, okay, you take it away, Alison. All right. So we're asking if you think June should be the start date, would you sort of wave your hands about? And I'm going to count hands. Thank you. Oh, a minute. Keep your hands going because don't drop them. I count slowly. One, two, three, four, five. Hold on, keep going. I've got to, the next page. Five. All right. Um, September. Who wants September? One, two, three, four. Do you know you're not going to believe this, Phil? Yeah. It's half and half. Is it? Is that telling us something? Do we have to run it twice? Can I say something? I don't. I don't want June if it excludes people who would otherwise be able to participate. We can be ready for June. Okay. Well, it might well be that we've got to think about June and September. As, as, as people know, we're on the call. Uh, there's another call later uh, that we'll be hearing from different regions and things like this. So um, we've, we've got it written down. So um, no, this is great. Thank, thank you so much. And uh, I, I really want to hope that before leaving that we could take a kind of screenshot. I don't know if you can you do that, Alison, your side, if we can ask people oh, to kind crumbs. of do a bit of a photo Me? of us all. Me? Yeah. Me? You're joking. But, how do I do that, guys? Dirk, how do I do that? Don't ask me, I'm blonde. Uh, but I, <laughs> one additional comment about June, September. Uh, in June, we will also have the Cyber Peace Conference. And at the end of the day, we are always the same teams involved in, in action. 
So, so uh, 19th of June, we have the peace conference. Uh, we might be freer in our minds and in everything in September. I'm just afraid with a virtual convention, with a peace, uh, cyber peace conference, that June might not be optimal because again, we are always the same, same faces around here. Yes, well, also, the, as people know, the World Beyond War and um, uh, no, no War 2021 is also in June as well. Um, so that's an, so let, let's come back to it. We're going to come back to you after we've um, listened to, to other people. Um, before we leave, two, two things. One, we'll let's say out loud what the next steps are so that everybody's clear and let's get clarity around that. Two, it would be great to get some photos. Uh, and then a third one, we want to say that this is one of many activities that we are working on. So Dirk has just set it up brilliantly for this. Thank you, Dirk. Um, so, so World Beyond War, oh, I should have made that a bit bigger here. Uh, World Beyond War and the Road to Action Group for Peace are working on many, many different initiatives. So you might be thinking, well, how else can I get involved in addition to this wonderful, great project, Peace Education and Action for Impact? Well, one is you can attend free of charge, uh, World Beyond War and um, No War 2021 conference. We've got some great speakers that are going to be there. Second, as Dirk mentioned, the Rotary Peace Fellows and Rotarians are putting together again another global conference. There was 1,500 participants last year. We hope for the same this year. Um, we will be putting on, but that actually depends on whether we go for this project in June or September, but we, will, we know with World Beyond War, we'll be running another course, at least. I hope oh, this is the plan to run um, in September, another course. Um, we have, for those that are interested that have young people, and you've heard from some of those superstar young people today, forward, uh, please get in touch with us um, uh, to engage with our World Beyond War Youth Network. Any young people you have, please put forward. We also have at World Beyond War an online course, which is free of charge, called Organizing 101, and it's really good, and it's free. So please check out that. Alison spoke earlier. We, um, we, we put together um, the Road to Action Group for Peace and World Beyond War, a Youth Voices um, session each Monday, free of charge. Also, the Alison, I don't know if you want to say anything about the Road to Action Group for Peace chapters and the chat with the chair. I think, I think probably we've said enough. I think if people have an interest, they know where to find us. The chats go on every night of the week, so the doors open and you can all join. I'm just conscious of people's time now. Yeah, so we want to respect people's time. So in, in terms of next steps, um, please email us with details. You have our email address also, so reach out to us. We will be having a conversation with different people in different regions later today um, to get their feedback. And we have your emails because you've gone through the Action Network. We will reach out to you to let you know some kind of next steps based on the conversation that we will have later today. That will include um, conversations, ideas, your thoughts around June or September, etc. Um, this is the first of, of many information sessions. So if we didn't cover everything today, we will be holding um, futures, future inf information sessions. And the idea is to tr transition from a general information sharing session to a more focused country project teams. Let's get this done and let's get it working, including you know, onboarding, application forms and everything like this. So it's a real transitional process that we've planned and worked out. So um, that's to, you know, to say out loud in terms of the, the, the next steps. Um, before we go, can we please take a photo of everyone? And Alison, you, have we worked out how to do that? I think I know how to do it. But. I've used my computer. Uh, I've used my phone, sorry. Okay, so um, let's- So get, I've done it that way. So I'm hoping I've got it that way. Let's get our smiley faces on then. And should we do a peace sign or something as well? All right, let's then I'll there. take another one. Smiley faces all around. Smiley faces, peace sign. Keep smiling, keep smiling, keep smiling through. Hold on, let me go to the second page. I don't want people left out. All inclusive. <laughs> Wonderful. We've got you. Right. Well, that's it. That, thank you so much, everybody. And basically, at the end of the day, we cannot do any of this without you. It doesn't matter how good our content is, doesn't matter how good our materials is, and this is how it should be. The, the, you know, the, a real people-driven movement comes from the local context. So we really are waiting for you, hoping for you to come to us and go, 
we want to do this. Let's make this work. So please, please, please reach out to us. And thank you so much for being with us. And have a great day, everyone, or night or whatever time you are. But thank you so much for joining us. And uh, yeah, thank you.